Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In last few lectures we have heard about various ways to analyze pathways from Dr. Kastan Krug. After understanding about how mutations affect phosphorylation leading alterations in the signaling pathways, today Dr. Kastan will talk about how one could use MIMP and GSEA in the hands on session. He will talk about how to use GitHub to obtain the basic codes and to use them without actually coding, but by manipulating codes as per your data and analysis requirement. Dr. Krupp will talk about use of two different formats for GCT files GCT 1.2 and GCT 1.3 and conditions when one could make use of this format to provide better results. So, let us welcome Dr. Kerstin Krug for his last lecture and learn more about usage of MIMP and GSEA. So, there will be two parts. The first part will that we will try to use uh, to, to predict mutation events affecting kinase substrate binding. So, this relates to the first part of my talk and here we will try something <coughs> very experimental we will try to use R. And actually I already prepared an R notebook file and I will you know talk about more what that is in R notebook and so on and so forth. But uh, you will find this kind of file here hands on mimp.rmd which stands from R markdown in, in the zip file that you hopefully all downloaded. You have to open R Studio and then you just load file. Go to file, open file, and then you open the R Markdown file, which is called hands on slash mimp.rmd. So, what you're looking at is an R, is a so called notebook. It's R code intermingled with you know just text. <coughs> who, who of you have heard about Markdown in general? Okay, so it's a, okay that is great. Markdown, it is a very simple text based format to create you know structured documents or like HTML pages and stuff like that. Uh, you know and there is extensions of that that allow you to execute code in these mark in these documents. And actually there is a link here about our notebooks and if you click on this link you will get some more information here. That is a very convenient way to, to analyze, to document your, your uh, analysis results and your code and also to share it with your collaborators. Maybe I will quickly show you the, the, the result of this whole analysis. At the end of the day you will have an HTML document which looks like that which you just open in your browser and there you will have some documentation about like the different steps. So, this is text that you entered. So, you can describe what, what kind, what is the goal of my analysis, what is the data input and output. But you will also have all kind of uh, you know R code that has been executed in order to get to that analysis results. And this you can easily share with your collaborators and you can just rerun everything uh, in order to get uh, to these results. So, but right now we just focus on that one. So, in, as you see, as you scroll down a bit, you see, uh, you know, this block here starts with R. So, this is actually R code here in this kind of block. And you can execute this code by just clicking on this little triangle here. Please try to do that. So, this might take, depending on Wi Fi con uh, connection, this might take some time 
because the first part actually sets up the entire analysis so it downloads a couple of packages again and so on and so forth. So if you could please try to click on this little triangle here. That's the first or it's uh, you know in line 25 that's probably easier. So in line 25 if you click on the on the triangle. I just want to very briefly touch base on what I have planned for the second part which is probably not going to happen because the website is down. But so there we wanted to use the medication calls for one particular TCGA sample and we wanted to use try to show you how you would operate this tool. So here's the link. You can click here on search, search mutations, and then you can upload your VCF file. So you know the VCF file we've learned about I mean, the VCF file is it's called what can you call format, right? And depending on your pipeline that you use to call your variants, you will get a VCF file. It's a pretty standard data format for variant calls. So it's not about that you have to create a VCF file, it's more about you should have gotten it from somewhere. You know, if, you, if you're, you know, uh, Ship your samples to sequencing center, they do the sequencing, you usually get a bank file back to so align past keys to the genome, which is bank. Then typically you would have some pipeline running in your lab, or maybe you're collaborating with someone who has genomics pipelines in place. They would take these bank files and you know, perform an invitation calling. The result of that are VCF files, for example. I mean, it's, very, it's not a very complicated format. I to do here. So once we, up, once we install all of the packages, we need to specify input data. Right? And here I have chosen a documentation file and a phosphocyte uh, file and the corresponding database file for one of the uh, like TCGA pages again. In order to make it more convenient for you, I put everything on GitHub. So it's automatically fetching the data from GitHub, so you don't have to go anywhere to download. It, uh, so it will happen automatically, and here you actually have the link to GitHub. So you can also just, uh, you know, copy this link. And if you go there, you see these uh, three files. The one is called mutation.txt, the other is psites.txt, and the other is a boss file. Right. And again, it's very simple format. Can everybody use that or you not? So this is very specific to the software that we are using here, right? So this is now MIP. And the you know, mutation file is uh, you know, divided into two columns. The first column is the gene name. And the second column is the amino you know, acid substitution that this mutation causes. Easy as that. So this link will be there. Also after the workshop, so we can always uh, come back. Mm -hmm. so if the installation succeeded, if the installation succeeded, please just go on top of the page, and then we will try to render this markdown document into an HTML report. And then we're going to look at the HTML report because it's just easier to do. So we. You should open some document. I don't know why. I'm just now talking about IPC here.
HTML document should be in the same order. So it goes to part one, where you found the on markdown file, and in the same order there should be now an HTML file. Could double check that. And here you have the entire report as HTML, which includes you know, some description about a project and also documents all different steps that we've done here. So first we install all of, all of the packages. You also see the output that, that was generated by, by the different code chunks here. Here you now have the direct link to GitHub. If you just click on that, you end up on my GitHub page. And so on and so forth. So meaning we specify the input data. What the script then does, it downloads the input files. Right? And then what the script does, it imports all of these files and you know, just shows the first couple of entries. And you all have that in your HTML file here. So this is the R code that creates that table. Does that make sense? So again, we're looking at a mutation file. We have two columns, G mutation, G name, mutation. The phosphoside file is similar. Again, so this is the code that generates this table. And what happens then is it will open up this result page. So this is what just happened when I ran MIMP. This is also one example that I was showing in, uh, like earlier t uh, in this morning. So this result page, here we see there's uh, three mutations that affect in total like 22 possible phosphorylation events. We see that most of them are losses. So meaning uh, a motif got lost. So the, the, phosphor, like the phosphocyte is most likely not phosphorylated anymore by the kinase it used to be. But we also observed two gains. So meaning now we suddenly see like an increase of, or a potential, a predicted increase of that phosphocyte to be occupied. So I just go to the last page. So these are the two events where we predicted a gain and here I just was showing or show you two examples of a phosphorylation gain. So basically, that's the wild type, that's the, the, the mutated version. So we see this uh, aspartic acid here, which is now being recognized by uh, like a novel kinase, right? So this motif fits to that particular kinase. So we predict or we assume that this phosphocyte is more likely to be phosphorylated now. So that, that's, that's the type of data right, that we get out of here. The objective or the goal of this hands-on session is to explore breast cancer subtype specific pathways. And we're gonna use the press cancer data set that we have used. But we're only looking at two subtypes just to make it, you know, a bit easier. We're just gonna look at basal and luminin A and the tables that I already created only contain these two subtypes, right? So we're gonna do, so this first exercise is optional, so this would involve Morpheus and I'm not sure how well this works here again. So we can skip that, I can just demonstrate how we use Morpheus or how you could more, uh, use Morpheus to create uh, or to convert your, your protein-centric tables or your phosphocyte-centric tables into gene-centric tables. So this is always what you have to do if you want to do path analysis. So again, this is optional, so you have al already the, the correct tables to move on. And then we will do two different ways of pathway of GSEA analysis. One is uh, like the classical, so to say, um, GSCA using this Java application that uh, everybody was able to download, or most of you. 
In the second approach, we're going to use the same data set and we will use single sample GSEA to project our protein matrix into pathways. And then I actually plan to use Morpheus again to perform some cluster analysis and marker selection on the pathways. So again, I cannot guarantee that this is going to work due to uh, internet connectivity, but we will at least try to do that. And again, so I try to make the slides as comprehensive as possible. So you should be able in theory, you know, to just go home, you have all of the data, you go through the slides and you can repeat these uh, exercises on your own. Just a quick recap. So that's the, the data set. We've you know, heard about this data set a couple of times already. And now we, we only want to look at basal versus luminal A. And just by eyeball and protein space, or like in this proteogenomic space, you clearly see differences. Now we're interested in so what are these pathways that are differentiating basal and luminal? And in this case, we're only looking at the cancer hallmark pathways. So it's a very small, compact, and well annotated, curated pathway database. So that's basically just what I said here. So we have two different data formats. And I got a lot of questions about GCT um, and how to create GCT files and how to open GCT files. Um, you know, these files are simple text files. You can open them these files in any text editor. And I would highly recommend to install or to use a text editor in your, on your PC. I would highly recommend Notepad++. This is what I use on Windows systems. And again, you know, if you just Google Notepad++, plus plus, it will, you know, bring you to the right page and you just download that. That's like a general recommendation from my side. So in, in this hands-on, we are going to use two different versions of GCT. One is called 1.2, that's the like older version of GCT, which, uh, you know, has been around for 10 years now, I, I suppose. And since a couple of years, uh, you know, they, they uh, revised the format and came up with a new one, which is called 1.3. And the only difference is that in 1.2, we only store the data, right? So we, we just store the data and, you know, we have two annotation columns or basically yeah, two annotation columns to describe the data. So that's uh, some, somebody made that like, you know, hard coded so you cannot change that. You always have to have two annotation columns and then you have your samples and your data. GCT 1.3, you can store metadata which describes your experiment, you know, for example. So for example, so this is like a snapshot of this data that we are going to use. And here, here's the data in this corner. And on top of that, we have all the metadata that, that describes the sample. So this is one sample here. You have the TCGA ID, and then we have all kinds of information. So which, you know, Team T channel, uh, you know, has been used to, to quantify that, which subtype it is, uh, you know, HER2, ER2, PR2, uh, uh, PR status, and so on and so forth. So the advantage of this format, although it, it might not be very intuitive in the beginning, but if you're getting used to that, it's very convenient because you store all of your metadata together with your data, right? You don't have to look through your computer and you know, find metadata that actually annotates your data matrix. What is a GCT file format? That's what you want to know, right? And how this file format is organized. I mean, here, if you spend, you know, 10 minutes or so, you will better understand what GCT means and how to create one. We have to use both versions because the Java application does only support GCT 1.2. Okay, so this step is now optional. Let's try to make it work. Let's try to go to Morpheus. And here you have different ways to, uh, you know, import your data. 
You can just browse your computer uh, if you have it on your Dropbox, or you can provide a an URL, or you can just simply drag and drop it into this window here. Right. So now what we're going to do, we go to, so that's the zip file. I'm going to quickly extract that here. So that's the one that you downloaded. So now if, you now go, if I now go into this file, you see two folders, GSA and single sample GSA. We are going to focus on the GSA one. Right. Everybody with me? And here you have two GCT files. So one, you know, proteome based Lumina A 1.2. And the other one says proteome gene. Genes. So this is gene centric, this is protein centric. So in case we are not able to use Morpheus, we already have the gene centric matrix. That's what I'm gonna but this is what I want to say here. But right now we try to just as an exercise, we just I just want to show you how you would do that. And for that you just drag and drop this file, the one without genes, into Morpheus. So drag and drop means you do this. Does that work for everyone? And here you already see, you know, that you have genes that appear multiple times here, right? So these are different isoforms. And, you know, these stripes basically tell you that we cannot really resolve these isoforms. They have very similar expression patterns because they have many peptides that are shared between those. And for pathway analysis, we need to have a single row for each gene. Does that make sense? If you would open it in Excel, this is what you would get, right? Just Excel, it's the same file. You see the number of genes here, or like proteins, and the number of sample columns, like 42. <coughs> and then you have the gene ID, you have some description, and then you have the data matrix. That's 1.2 format. Easy as that. That's the same file, just we look at at this in Morpheus. You can easily, I mean, you know, I don't want to go into in too much detail, but you can easily, I think in the later slides I show how to, how to change the annotations. For example, you could go and say, okay, I also want to look at the description. Right. So you, this is highly, you know, customizable. And maybe again, you have to spend some, like, you know, a couple of minutes and just play around with your own data, but Everything is possible here. So what, but what we want to do, we want to do, we want to create gene-centric tables. So you click on tools, that's the first step. Then you click on collapse. And then you should see this window popping up here. I can, I'm going to do the same in parallel here. Tools, collapse. So then you have to pick the field that you want to use to collapse. And in your case, it's the ID column. So this is the first column here shown, which contains the, the gene IDs, right? And here you can also specify whether you want to collapse rows or columns. It really depends, right? We want to combine or collapse different rows. And here you can choose how you want to collapse them, median or mean. Again, it's very, there's no clear answer what, you know, what would work best. So median is usually more robust against any, like, outliers. So we're going to do that. And then I just click OK. And then you will see that a, you will get a new data tab here. And now you can also go back and forth, right? If I click here, that's the protein-centric matrix. If you click here, that's the gene-centric matrix. So you see that each gene symbol now is listed only once. So it's you know, very convenient to create these tables. And if you want to download that result table, you can just do so by clicking on File, Save Data Set. You can you know, pick a GCT version, you can give it a name, and so on and so forth. And then you can just click OK. So now you're ready to do GSEA, and that's what we're going to do now, okay? 
So now I want you, and again, so here is a step-by-step -step manual how to do all of this, right? So you should be able to, to do that at home. So now it's GSEA time. And I saw for a large fraction of you guys, you got it to run. So please try to open GSEA, the Java application. So you should be able to see this kind of screenshot here, or like this kind of window. And I try to do the same on my PC. So if this JNLP file is not automatically associated with Java, like here on my PC, you can just right click on it. Then you should be able to see Java Web Start Launcher. Launcher, so then you should be able to open the app. And once this is uh, finished, we should be able to see the GSA window. So now it asks me whether I want to run this application. And I just say yes, run. All right. So it's a bit, little bit small on my screen here, so because of my resolution. But Java also, or uh, GSA also comes with a very extensive documentation. And also, like the entire user interface is. You know, if you, uh, if you pay some attention, it's very intuitive. Because they, here on this start page already, they actually, you know, describe all the different steps that you have to do. Steps in GSEA. So this is exactly what we're going to do now. So what do we need for GSEA? We need expression data. So this is our GCT 1.2 file that we just created. We need phenotype annotation. So because we don't have the metadata about our samples in our GCT file, because it's 1.2. We need an extra file in order to tell the software what is luminal samples and what are basal samples. Right? And that's why GCT is so convenient, because you don't have to worry about any other files. So everything is in your file. But in order to make this work, we have to create a phenotype label file. And I'm going to show you how we do that. And we have to this, uh, pick a gene set database. And again, so here you can upload your own gene sets. You can download different databases, which you can upload here. Or it also uh, you know, directly links to the MCDB page. So you, you are sure that you always get uh, the latest version. The phenotype labels are stored in so-called CLS format. Here, if you follow that link, you will get, again, more information about that format. It's, again, something broad specific that has been used for a while. But now, because we have GCT 1.3, uh, you know, that's not really required anymore. But however, for this particular application, it still is. And I mean, what is important here is the third line. So the third line uh, contains the same number of uh, you know, uh, uh, columns here than your GCT file has samples. So in this case, we have, in our CLS file, we will have 42, which is in the same order than the columns in your GCT file. Right. And then you can say, OK, first column is basal, second column is luminal, and so on and so forth. And I already prepared that file. And you can find that in your GSA folder, So, which is called Phenotype labels.cls. So if I open that in WordPad, so the first line tells you how many samples do you have, 42. The second line specify, or the second uh, uh, cell here uh, uh, specifies how many groups do you have in your file. So it's two, luminal, luminal and basal. And the third one has to be always one. Don't ask me why, but this is what it says on the web page. The second line always starts with um, the hashtag here. And then it, it lists both labels, like a unique you know, representation of your class labels. 
And then the third line is the important one, where you just you know, define for each sample, and again, this has to be in the same order, then your GCT file, and you say, okay, this is the first sample is basal, second sample is basal, third sample is luminal A, okay? Okay, now let's try to import the data first. So we are going to go through these steps, and this is also the order which is shown here on the left, right? So the first step is to load data. So we, you will end up on this page here. So again, you have uh, different options how to import data. Go to your data, and now just make sure that you select the uh, genes version this time. So that's the gene-centric version. And I just drag and drop it here. So now the file is here. And I do the same with the phenotype labels. All right? So we have both files here. And in order to actually load these files, you have to press this button here, load these files. So there will be this pop-up window which tells you, okay, I, up, I uploaded two files. These are the names of the files. And files loaded successfully, two out of two, which is promising, and there were no errors. So now I'm just going to hide this window. I just click OK. That's it. And then again, if you go back to my PowerPoint presentation, you will see all these steps that we just have done here. Okay, now we are going to the next page, which is called One GSEA. So here we are going to define parameters that we're going to use during our pathway analysis. So please click on One GSEA. I'm going to do the same on my PC here. One GSEA. So here on the first set of parameters, so these are required fields, so you have to define those. So the, which is, you know, this is an expression data set, the gene set database, number of permutations. So why do we need to do permutations? Say it again. Almost. So we are doing permutations. I mean, if we would just calculate it once, we would get an enrichment score, which wouldn't tell us much because we don't know, you know, what does this score tell me? So we're doing permutations. We are doing permit. We are permuting the class labels or our samples, repeating this entire analysis 1,000 times in this case. So we will get a distribution of enrichment scores. And then we can go back and, and actually calculate the probability that our actual enrichment score that we got is in the tail of the distribution or not, which tells us, okay, this one is significant or it's not. We can use that to calculate p-values, right? So that's the main purpose. So we are generating a background distribution you know, of false positives enrichment scores because we randomly shuffle these last labels, so it shouldn't make any sense, right? We get a negative distribution. Then we look where in this distribution does our actual enrichment score fall into. Okay, these are the number of permutations, and then we have to specify the phenotype labels. So let's, how about we just do it? We just start at the top here. And if, if you click on that, there will be only one data set loaded, right? So we specify that one. Gene set database. So this might take a second or two because now it's connecting to the broad uh, service. Okay, here we go. So now I'm going to click on here. So it says gene matrix, gene matrix local GMT. Okay. Okay, so you have to import this database first, like we have, like we imported the, the GCT file and the, the class label file. So please go back to load data, and then please 
please go to the single sample GSEA folder. So right now we were here in the GSEA. Now I go one folder up, and there will be another one called single sample GSEA. And in that folder, you will, you will find this file, h dot or version one, version six point one. So that's the hallmark database, and you can just again simply drag and drop it into GSEA. So now, if we go back to one GSEA, we we should be able to. to see the database once we get the error message again. OK, now I'm able to see this file here, right? OK, so number of permutations we just discussed. So now we load the phenotype labels. So here, here you can select, in the first uh, panel here, you can select the source file. So there is only one, right? So you could also have multiple phenotype labels, and you can you know, play around with different ones. But here we only have one. But here, now it actually lets you select what kind of comparisons do you want to do. Do you want to do basal versus luminal, or do you want to do luminal versus basal? Right? You can just you know, pick one. And I just leave it at basal versus luminal. And I click OK. OK, now we are almost done. So, so the next uh, option here is actually very important. So collapse data set to gene symbols. So that's what we have done already in Morpheus. So just keep in mind that this software has been developed in 2005. I mean, not this, not this particular software itself, but like the, the principle of gene set enrichment analysis. So there was no proteomics and no RNA-seq, no, I mean, not, you know, there was no RNA-seq and no proteomics to the extent that we know now. So this has been developed for microarrays, right? And the software comes with uh, the option to collapse microarray probes to genes. So this is what this option is for. So we, can, we are not able to use that here. So that's why we have to deselect that. We just say false. Use data set as is. So that's what we want to do. So permutation type, you can either select whether you want to do permutations on your phenotypes, meaning on your sample columns, or you can do the permutations in your gene sets. So why would you do, why would you have to choose or change this option? So can you think of a scenario where you cannot do your permutations on your phenotype labels, on your sample columns. What would that be? So one is based on the phenotype, and the other is based on the gene set. So in option one, we would permute the sample columns and the phenotype labels. In option two, we would permute the gene sets. We would randomly generate gene sets, nonsense gene sets, to create our background distribution. Exactly. If you have a sufficient number of samples, and I would already consider 40 or so as you know, sufficient, you can, permit, you can do the permutations across your samples. If you just have two biological replicates, you cannot do permutations on two replicates, right? So then you would choose gene set. But in this case, we have like 40 samples in total. It's totally fine to to do our permutations there. OK, so now we actually filled out all required fields. So now we can, we can expand the basic fields, and we're just going to do some, some small adaptions here. So first of all, we can just give it an, an analysis name, hands-on IIT. Workshop. And what is probably the most important uh, option here? I mean, you know, in, in principle, you don't have to worry about these kind of parameters. What you would have to worry about 
Probably in some scenarios is how you do your ranking. If you remember, so GSEA works on a ranking of your genes. So it would rank, in our case, luminal versus basal. So it has to do some sort of marker selection or some sort of ranking that differentiates luminal from basal. So the default option is signal to noise. Which is basically, if I'm correct, it's basically the, 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 the average between luminal, luminal and basal. The difference in average is divided by the product of the standard deviations of both groups. Right? That gives you a measure. It's basically the full change divided, or uh, uh, the full change between luminal and basal scaled by the standard deviation, right? If you have a higher fold change, but a higher standard deviation as well, you would end up with a lower fold change. Whereas if you really have a high difference, a high fold change, and a very low standard deviation, your denominator would be very small, and you would still get a high fold change. You could also do, I think this requires at least, they say on a web page, uh, you should have at least three or so samples in each phenotype if you want to do that. You could also do, for example, t-test. You know, that's probably the second that I would recommend. Or other metrics like you know, Euclidean distance between luminal and basal or uh, correlation and, and things like that. Right? There's different metrics how to rank your genes. In general, I would recommend to just leave it as signal to noise as, as long as you have sufficient number of samples. So we're going to leave that here. And you know, so this might be interesting for you because that's the folder where you can find the results afterwards. So this is where GSA stores its results. And you can also change that folder, but this is like per default, you will find the results here. And these other filters here, you can exclude gene sets that have fewer than 15 members and more than 500 samples. I mean, these are pretty good default parameters, so you don't have to worry about them too much. OK, I think this should be everything that we need to actually perform the GSA, GSA analysis. And in order to run that, you just have to click this little one button here. OK, now it shows success, too, for me. So. Let's take a look at the results. And you can just click on, on success, and then there should be a, a page should pop up, like an HTML report, which summarizes your results. That is false detection rate, right? FDR is a false discovery rate. False discovery rate. Exactly. So that has to be less. Yes. This is basically the, the fraction of, let's say we have like 100 pathways, right? And if it says you have an FDR of 5%, this tells you that five pathways are actually false positives in your okay. list of significant pathways. Yeah, so here the default parameter in GSA is 25, which is very loose, right? But you can, you can uh, also adjust that parameter. So we are looking at FDR, so false discovery rate smaller than 25%. So 25 is actually pretty high, right? So that's the default setting here. Um, and you know, there's probably nothing that you would put in the paper, right? But it helps you to you know, get a first glimpse on your data. You will have all of these results uh, in an Excel sheet as well, where you have the FDRs, and then you can just filter or only look at the pathways at a certain FDR. So this is basically, I think this parameter has been used in the original study back in 2005, and it still made it until the latest version here. So it's basically a summary of, you know, very high level summary of your results. So you have like these two blocks here. The first block tells you, this is the enrichment and phenotype basal. Is everybody with me? 
So we see we have 19 samples in basal. Um, the second block is enrichment in phenotype luminin A, where we have 23 samples. And then you can get some, uh, you know, high level uh, summary here. So, for example, 34. So I told you that the Hallmark database has 50 gene sets. So that's why here it says 34 out of 50 gene sets are upregulated. So they have a positive enrichment score. So they are more enriched in basal compared to luminal. In luminal, we only have 16, right? And this should add up to 50. This does not mean that they are significant or whatsoever, right? This just tells you the direction. So here at FDR, 25%, and again, this is very high, I know. But again, that's a summary, and it tells you it's five gene sets that are below 25% for basal. And there's two gene sets that are below 25% for luminal A. And all of these, uh, you know, this, this entire page is, again, these are different hyperlinks that will forward you to the actual results. So here you have a, a summary about your data set. So we were looking at 11,000 genes and so on and so forth. And here's the, the summary about your gene set database. And also, you have very detailed and very extensive documentation about GSCA because it is such an old software, or old approach, very well developed, very well maintained and curated. You have a lot of documentation and tutorials online. And here already you find a direct link how to interpret the results. You can just click on that and you will find all the information you need in order to make sense out of this result page. So what I'm going to show you, and here you also have a direct link to the Excel sheet, as you can see. Right? If you click on that, it should be an Excel sheet. So that's now the, the, the path values for Basil. Right, and here you also have the FDR, well, uh, the FDR value, where you can just, just uh, focus on the first two, which are below 5% uh, and then you're below 10%, right? Okay, let's look at an example here. So what I did now, I, I clicked on enrichment in phenotype basal. I clicked on detailed enrichment results in HTML format. So this is kind of a similar table that you got in, in Excel format, but now it's in HTML and you have these different hyperlinks here. So the most significant or most differential pathway is apparently a G2M checkpoint, so some cell cycle. So now for each of these gene sets or pathways, you can click on GS details. And you will actually get these enrichment plots. Right? So here we're looking at the G2M checkpoint signature. We have the P value and the, Q and the DFDR value, which is associated to, with this uh, pathway. And we also have this enrichment plot here. Right. So on the x-axis, we have the genes which are ranked ordered according to their differential expression between basal, which is shown on the left, and luminal A, which is shown on the right. So these are all the genes here in this area, all the genes that are more abundant in basal. Here are the genes that are more abundant than luminal A. And all of these vertical bars in this case are members of that particular pathway. And again, just by eyeballing, you see you know, this cluster of members here, right, which are, which basically do cluster among genes that are very, very abundant in basal subtype. Right. And if you, if you calculate uh, the enrichment score, so if you now look 
as another example for luminal A. We can also look at a snapshot of enrichment in the results. This should be like a summary about all of the pathways. So what are the, so this is the most significant ones. This is the second most significant one. And we see both of them, both of them are estrogen related. Es estrogen responds early, estrogen responds late. Does that make sense? So we are comparing lumin luminal A versus basal. Now we are looking at luminal specific pathways and mo many of these uh, luminal tumors are, are yeah, positive. Right? And this is actually the, the hallmark cancer pathways that, pathway that we are seeing here in this set. So what is shown here is the signal to noise that we've calculated. It also says that here. And here, according to that, this is the ranking of my genes in my entire data set. So we had like 11,207 genes in this data set. And this is the ranking according to the signal, no signal to noise statistic comparing basal and luminal A subtypes. So again, so what these genes here are more abundant in basal subtype. These genes on, on, on that side here of the ranking are more abundant in luminal A subtype. Right? And again, so here we see a clear enrichment. So these vertical bars, again, are members of this particular gene set. Right? The estrogen responds early, and we see a clear cluster of these members here in genes that are more abundant in luminal A subtype. So I think the most difficult part is to get the data into the right format. And I gave you some hints to use Morpheus and so on and so forth. In today's lecture, I hope you learned how to use R scripts and incorporate data in MIMP and GSEA tools for understanding and visualization of your data. Use of Morpheus to convert your data set which is protein centric or phosphocentric to gene centric which can be used as an input for GSEA. The next session is going to be again hands on session in which Dr. Bing Jiang will talk about how one could use linked omic tools. Thank you.